Funding for Amish cooking from quilt country with Marsha Adams was provided by... Sauter Woodworking, America's furniture craftsman. And by Marilat Industries, America's cabinet maker, committed to quality and a variety of kitchen and bath cabinetry styles. Hello, I'm Marsha Adams. Today we're going to talk about vegetables and the rich harvest that comes from Amish gardens. Over the last decade, we have seen a phenomenal increase in the range of unfamiliar fruits and vegetables at the supermarkets. Yet shoppers keep buying the old favorites like corn and beans and tomatoes and carrots, all of those good things we know and love. Now the Amish raise all of these vegetables in their gardens and they've developed fine recipes for using them. Some of the recipes date clear back to their days in Europe in the 1700s and some others though show the influence of America such as that American dish succotash. And you can start when you, with succotash by using the frozen corn or you can have your own fresh from the garden and you of course first uh, clean an ear of corn like this and silk it and then you would want to blanch it about three to five minutes and then after it's blanched you see it's darkened up a little bit you would cut the corn off with your knife see how that is and I want to tell you another little trick so you can get all that good corn off, flavor off of this ear you take the back side of your knife and you go like this, and you get out all the good milky substance. So do that to every ear of corn. Now the recipe for succotash always has corn and beans in it. And that was the basic, and it's still the basic. And here we have already pre-cooked two cups of lima beans. And lima beans are kind of a firm vegetable, so they need to be cooked anywhere between 15 to 18 minutes if you're doing it in a conventional pattern on the stove. And to that, we're going to add two cups of corn, and three tablespoons of margarine or butter, depending on your feelings about that subject, and half a cup of cream. Now, if you really wanted to save calories, you could use skim milk, but cream gives it the richness that the dish deserves. And a speck of sugar. I think that sugar, just a speck added to vegetables, brings out its natural sweetness. Some people don't use it, but I would tell you the few calories it adds, it's worth it to have that flavor enhancer in your vegetable dishes. And then we're going to add here about a teaspoon of savory. Now certainly the Amish would not use savory because they don't use a lot of herbs, but I thought this dish really was improved by adding savory. And any time I changed one of their authentic recipes such as this and would add something like savory, I would put it in parentheses behind the recipe because I want you people to know what was real Amish and what isn't. Then we're going to add some salt and pepper. Mix this up. See, it's very pretty. And then we're going to simmer that on low heat for about, I would say, five or ten minutes. The idea is for the corn and the beans to absorb the milk. See that right there. The Amish gardens are tilled by the men with teams of horses just as soon as they can work the soil in the spring. Then the women come in and do the planting and from then on it's their responsibility. And of course that includes all of the harvesting and the canning. I discovered that some of the men were very proud of their wives' efforts and several have taken me out to see the gardens which were always bordered by lovely rows of annual flowers. They don't have perennial borders, they have annual flowers. Let's give this a stir. Well, this isn't quite ready yet. I'm going to turn up the stove and I hope someone will signal to me if this starts burning. <laughs> so while that is simmering and finishing up, I'm going to show you some vegetables that the Amish do grow in their gardens. How many of you have seen seed potatoes? These are the potatoes that are used for seed. Now you wouldn't, that's a pretty big seed, right? And these things here are called eyes, and those will be the top sprouts of the potatoes. And when they're planted, the potatoes are cut up in pieces like this. And you want to have an eye 
in every hill. And that's what you call the, uh, the planting process. You drop these in the ground, and that's called a hill of potatoes. And from one of these potatoes, you may get 20 to 30 potatoes, which grow underground. Now, another thing that we plant at our house, just as soon as we can work the soil in the spring, are onion sets. And aren't these good ones? These are some of the best onion sets I've ever had. And you put them side by side. We do it rather close together, just like that. And from that, of course, are little green onions. Another thing I like to do early in the season is to plant a lettuce blend. And I'll buy several varieties, just like this. And I put it together in a little dish, and then just plant it all together in one row. And I do this about every two weeks, just as soon as I can work the soil. Because what happens, during hot weather, lettuce bolts, and that means it goes to seed and becomes bitter. But really, the salad blend is a good idea because you have different colors of lettuce all the time, and it's right out there in the same row. Now, I do smell this. It's looking good. Give this a stir. I think that's ready. Beans and corn have been an important vegetable for centuries. They were cultivated by the American Indians long before the English arrived. And the, really, the first pilgrims would have starved if it hadn't been for these corn and beans pressed on them, and they really insisted that they take them, pressed on them by the Indians. And just think now what a classic dish this is. And traditionally, we now serve this on Thanksgiving tables as sort of homage to those first Native Americans who helped out the pilgrims during that first grim year. You know, I might add that the original version probably was made with bear grease, but we'll skip that recipe today. The next dish I call honey carrots with sweet pickle. It's quick, it's colorful, and it's absolutely delicious. Did you know that the carrot is related to anise, caraway, celery, parsnips, parsley, and also one of my very favorite wildflowers, Queen Anne's Lace. Now this grows all over the Midwest in fields and along roadsides, and I bring in large armloads of it every summer to do rather contemporary bouquets. And in the summer in New York City, even the priciest restaurants will have little bouquets of Queen Anne's Lace on their table. So you see, it's become a very chic thing. So, for the carrot recipe, and this is one of those quick, easy recipes that's also delicious, we're going to begin with the sauce that's going to give it a very pretty glaze. And we start with three tablespoons here of butter, or you can use margarine, and a fourth of a cup of orange juice and a fourth of a cup of honey. Now we get a lot of flavored honeys out here in the Midwest. We get blueberry honey and thistle honey and strawberry honey. It all depends where the hives were. That's a fourth of a cup of honey, fourth of a cup of orange juice. And then we're going to add a teaspoon of orange rind, grated, and a half a teaspoon of salt, and half a teaspoon of pepper, and half a, half a teaspoon of ground ginger. And then to that, we're going to add two cups of Carrots. Now these have been done in a food processor and we use the medium slicing blade. They're about a fourth of an inch thick. And then you mix all that up and you cook that on medium heat for about 20 minutes and stir it occasionally. Now I have another one simmering over here on the stove and I'm going to add the final ingredient to it that makes it so absolutely delicious. And that final ingredient are these pickle cubes. And in my part of the country, we're able to buy something called salad pickles. And they're very coarsely chopped sweet pickles. And they're absolutely perfect to use in dishes like this or in macaroni salad or potato salad, where you want to bite down on a very well-defined piece of pickle. Do not use sweet pickle relish in here. It's not correct. So here we're going to add these three tablespoons of coarsely chopped sweet pickles and mix it up. You can see how pretty that is. <laughs> you know, 
The Amish raised lots of carrots and they stored them down in their basements in crocks during the winter. For those of us who buy them at the supermarket, it's best if you can get those that have the tops on because those um, are fresher. Older carrots are very much apt to have cracks or to have little tiny white rootlets on them and you certainly don't want to use those. I'm going to set this out here. Had you noticed what we're using? These are Amish handkerchiefs and I bought them at an Amish uh, uh, store where they sell groceries and clothes and also hardware. These make perfect napkins and just wash and wear beautifully. There are great stories about carrots. Presumably, the Athenian soldiers who were sequestered in the Trojan horse existed exclusively on carrots. Now that would really be a great trivia question. What did the soldiers eat when they were in the Trojan horse? The next recipe is uh, just a real honey. In the Mennonite church cookbooks that I researched, I found lots of salads that could be made in advance so they could be carried to family dinners or to quilting bees or to church socials. Now, if these salads happen to have hard-boiled eggs or hard-cooked eggs, more properly called, those, those salads were always called daisy salads because the hard-boiled egg, when it was sliced, looked like a daisy. And this next dish falls into that classification. It's a pea and spinach salad that you make several hours ahead of time and you toss just before serving. And we're going to begin by making the dressing. And in my bowl here is one cup of commercially made mayonnaise. And you can make it yourself if you want to, but there's nothing the matter with using this commercially made mayonnaise. And then to that, we're going to add one garlic clove. It's been very finely smashed. And a half a teaspoon of salt and a half a teaspoon of pepper. I have a corn kernel in there, that's all right. And we're going to add a lovely herb, tarragon. Now the Mennonites might use tarragon, the Amish would not. And then mix this up real quickly. And that's your dressing. The tarragon will give this a real lilt. Now we're going to do the salad greens. Isn't this bowl just gorgeous? I'm coveting it, I'm coveting it. Now in our assortment of greens today, we've used bib lettuce and we've used the ruby tip lettuce, which is one that I raise in my own garden. And of course we're using spinach. Now spinach was first found growing wild in Persia. And this was why. It was cultivated mainly to satisfy the appetites of much prized Persian cats. Now I have a Hamalian cat, and she falls within the classification of a Persian. However, I do not think she would eat spinach. She likes yum yums. And the crew has told me it is not necessary for me to show you pictures of my cats again this time, so I shan't. But I want you to know that my cats got a lot of fan mail. So let's continue on. On top of these greens, and I would suggest a half a pound of spinach, which you might want to grow for your cats too, and a half pound of the assorted greens. We're going to add a cup and a half of blanched green peas. You can blanch these just about a minute. You want them to be very fresh tasting. And then we're going to add some red onion rings for color. See how pretty this is? This is a great buffet dish too. I just, I'm always looking for those dishes that I can use for entertainment. And then we're going to use a cup of alf alfalfa sprouts. Healthy, isn't it? I'll talk to you about how to raise alfalfa alfa sprouts later on. Half a cup of parsley, minced. And then the daisy part, hard cooked eggs. And I have this wicked instrument that I use to slice them up. I call it an egg guillotine, and I'm sure you have them. Rather, rather, I'm not sure probably many people even eat hard-boiled eggs, hard-cooked eggs anymore. And you lay that egg business on top like that. Hence the name, Daisy, Daisy Salad. The Amish do raise sprouts 
and you can have actually many kinds of sprouts like mung beans or radishes. Radish seeds make great sprouts. But I still keep going back to alfalfa sprouts. There, how pretty that is. And then we're going to put the dressing over the top. Another hint about spinach that I want to mention to you is that it has a tendency to hold sand and soil on its leaves. So you should be very, very careful that you wash it impeccably. And some cooks say that you should rinse it at least seven times. And I, I'm inclined to agree with that. That's how it looks when it's finished. Now ordinarily, you would put this in the refrigerator and let it stand for three to five minutes. And the dressing keeps the uh, greens moist. You can see how convenient this is. But I want to serve it right now so you can see how pretty it is. So we're just going to toss it. And we're just going to pretend it's been chilling for three to five minutes. Oh, excuse me, I mean three to five hours. This even has a pretty ring. There. Now, I'm ready to dish up. I wonder where that expression came from, dish up. <laughs> we ought to have a, one of the daisy parts of this salad on there. How's that? With the uh, eggs in this, you can tell that this is a very hearty salad and you could almost have this with just a bowl of soup and that's all you would need for lunch. The next dish is a very old-fashioned dish, and it's also a Dunkard recipe. And when I speak of the Dunkards, I'm referring to a group of people that came out of the Church of the Brethren, as did the Amish and the Mennonites and the Baptists. And their lifestyle uh, and their recipes is really quite similar to old order Mennonites. But they do have electricity and they do drive cars. But I would also tell you, they dress conservatively with the black bonnets. I'm going to put this over here. This really, for such a simple recipe, has a lot of ingredients. There, I'm ready to begin. And this is one of those great recipes that you are able to use up a lot of zucchinis. Now, my grandmother, great-grandmother was a Dunkard, and some of the recipes in my cookbook are hers. And this recipe for the zucchini and tomato casserole happens to be one of them. So here are thinly sliced zucchinis on the bottom of a layered casserole. Excuse me, buttered casserole. Actually, this is more of a technique than a recipe because you could make great big dishes of this or you could make smaller dishes, but you want to do it in layers. And the first layer is always thinly sliced, fresh zucchini. And then you put on a layer of fresh tomatoes which have been peeled. I much prefer the, uh, that you always peel your tomatoes. The skin is pretty unpleasant uh, texture in one's mouth, I think. And then we're going to add a few more of these onion rings. You should have an equal amount of tomatoes and zucchini. So if you use six zucchini, use six tomatoes. And then we're going to add the seasoning. We want a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And then one of the secret ingredients would be this brown sugar because that makes it just a little bit rich and it takes away that awful sourness that you might find in tomatoes. Though I wouldn't think, it, that's, that's the wrong adjective to use. It isn't an awful sourness, it just might be too tart. So you add a little bit of this brown sugar. And then we're going to have the basil. And we have two kinds of basil today. Such a luxury, oh it smells so good. This is the big leafed basil and this is called cinnamon globe and it's very little as you can see. Now when it reaches its full size, it looks very much like the boxwood that you see in Williamsburg, Virginia. So it's really a good uh, edging for even a perennial border. But I think today that we're going to use the big leafed basil. Uh, use as much as you like. I happen to think that you should be liberal with basil because I happen to love it. I mean, I would eat a basil sandwich. So, um, but conventionally speaking, you might want to use for six servings a rounding half teaspoon. There we are. That looks very good already, doesn't it? And the next ingredient will be the cracker crumbs. Just cover it liberally with crumbs. 
Sometimes I make this in a great earthenware casserole and it cooks up well. And then dot it with butter. Some people make zucchini bread as a way of using up zucchini and that's quite taste or zucchini cake. There. And then overall, you want to put a lot of grated cheese. The trouble is the zucchini, is that there's so many of them always. And I must tell you that I think that in my little town where I live, there's a zucchini ferry in August that goes around my little town and deposits bags of zucchinis on everybody's doorstep. There we are. Now, you want to cover this with foil or a lid, if your casserole happens to have it, and bake it at 350 degrees for a half hour. And then uncover it and bake it for 45 minutes longer. It should be bubbling up in the center when it's finished. And this one is, has done that. Mmm, smells so good. Here we are. Isn't that handsome? Now this is a great buffet dish. It holds up well and it's a wonderful combination of flavors and textures. But I do want to tell you this. I'm gonna put a little part, that isn't what I want to tell you. What I want to tell you is this does not freeze well. It does not freeze before it's baked and it doesn't freeze well after it's baked. However, it's not bad warmed up the next morning for breakfast. Not only do the Amish harvest vegetables such as these, but they also harvest apples as well, which frequently end up in cider. We visited a Mennonite cider press to see just how they make it. Vernon Miller of Middlebury operates a water-powered cider press on his farm. People come from all over Michigan and Indiana bringing in their apples from their orchards to be pressed for cider. This is an absolutely beautiful pastoral setting. The old barn was the site of the original cider press, and it's also been a grist mill, as well as a sawmill, so it really has an interesting history. The day was so still that the mill race acted as a mirror, reflecting the trees with their autumn foliage. The Amish bring in their apples by buggy. The triangle reflector is now required by law in most states, though some very conservative communities don't comply to this ruling. These people from Michigan drove two hours to come here. It's a pleasant Saturday afternoon outing. First, the apples come in by conveyor belt and are washed. Then they go through a hammer mill and are chopped to a coarse pulp. About three and a half bushels of apples will be put on top of each porous blanket. Then the blanket's folded together in a press rack. Then another press rack is placed on that, then another blanket. This process is repeated eight times, and one stack will take 27 bushels at one pressing. Many of us do have strong ideas about what apples should go into a cider blend. Ideally, it should be a combination of both sweet and sharply tart apples. And I personally think, as my grandmother did, who prided herself on her cider, that the addition of Northern Spy Apples gives cider a real depth of flavor that's unbeatable. Some people will even add a few pears. Mr. Miller's own favorite blend is two bushels of yellow apples, one bushel of Jonathan, and one bushel of wine saps. The weight of the press is about 2,000 pounds. This will yield anywhere between 85 to 100 gallons of cider. The pulp is discarded into a pit, then elevated out onto a trailer and is piled in one of his fields, where the sheep and the cattle eat what they want from it. It's much too acid to use as fertilizer. The juice is strained through coarse nylon, then transferred into these plastic jugs. Incidentally, cider freezes very well. The customers either buy new jugs, but most bring their own. The Millers also make apple butter and boiled cider. I was thrilled to find this boiled cider because it's a very old-fashioned ingredient, and the Millers suggested using it on pancakes and hot biscuits. 
The Amish people also make a lot of apple butter, and this is what this is. And it also is a group project when they do it, just like they're quilting bees. And the quilt I have to show you today is a nine patch variation. You're really going to like it. But first, let's review the dishes. Old fashioned succotash, carrots with sweet pickle, a daisy salad, which I told you to uh, chill three to five minutes. I meant three to five hours. And this wonderful buffet dish, zucchini and tomatoes. Now, on to the quilt. This is a nine patch variation, as I told you earlier, and it's a splendid one. It's valued at $6,000. It was made between 1915 and 1925 in LaGrange County, Indiana. It has very unusual colors for an Amish quilt, and I chose it because it reminded me of the tones of autumn and that misty quiet day when we were at the cider mill. The fundamental design, however, consists of three blocks of three squares each, and then they're sewn together to make a square. And then that square appears the same, whether it's viewed horizontally or vertically. The pattern's a simple one, but with all the possibilities allowed within its patches, it can be a very intriguing quilt, as you can see. It also has some Velcro on the back, so sometime in its history, it's hung on the wall. Notice this little touch of red here. It, in cooking terms, would be like a garnish, a touch of paprika. Until next time, as a goot, eat good. All recipes seen in this series are available in Marsha Adams' book, Cooking from Quilt Country. This hardcover contains nearly 200 Amish and Mennonite recipes with color photographs and descriptions of the food and folkways of America's heartland. The cost of the book is $24.95 plus handling. Please have your credit card ready when you call 1-800-325-2667. Series 2 of Amish Cooking from Quilt Country is available on home video for $59.95 plus shipping. All 13 programs in this second series are compiled on three VHS cassettes. Call 1-800-325-2667 for credit card orders. Funding for Amish cooking from quilt country was provided by Merrillat Industries, America's cabinet maker, committed to quality.